Hey, this time we're going to look at something very fascinating, and this is the image of the beast from the Bible. And it may sound or seem strange, but we are going to start from this Maitreya project, which is a Buddhist teaching, if you will. So let's look at this first, and then uh, we're going to move on. And hopefully by the end of it, you'll understand what the image of the beast in the Bible is. So check out this short clip. <laughs> Right. We're going to stop right there because this is enough, it's enough of this. So, he's talking about love, kindness, well-being and all that kind of things. Which could be familiar from somewhere else which we're going to take a look at but now let's just look at what this Maitreya project is right so here we are MaitreyaProject.org and it says the aim of Maitreya project is to bring long-term social and economic benefit to millions of people in northern India and sustain spiritual benefit to the world community. Quote, world peace must develop from inner peace. Peace is not just the absence of violence. Peace is the manifestation of human compassion. His Holiness of the Dalai Lama. Now I am going to approach this from a biblical viewpoint. So... I do not subscribe to none of this uh, nonsense that it's in B Buddhism and Hinduism and all the rest that we're going to look at. So just so that you're aware, we're going to look at it from the strict, strictly biblical uh, eyes. So that's how we're going to look. Now, this project is going to be a statue. And he's going to describe it right here. The Maitreya statue will now be built in Bodhgaya. But due to restrictions there, the statue won't be as tall as originally planned, which was 500 feet. That's ridiculous. Now it is going to be 150 feet in height. Here, a little bit later, you can read, once the Maitreya statue has been built, it will benefit the world and the sentient beings of the six realms, particularly those in this world, not only for a thousand years, but also for a very long time after that. Any sentient being who remembers, sees, touches or hears about the statue and of course, no question, those who actually build the statue, who offer time, life, money, and all the different things needed to actualize the statue, all those sentient beings will ultimately achieve full enlightenment. So, there's that magic word, word 
enlightenment. Well, now what does the Bible say about all this nonsense? Let's just check it out. Leviticus 26. Ye shall make you no idols, nor graven image, neither rear you up a standing image, neither shall ye set up any image of stone in your land to bow down to it, for I am the Lord your God. Okay, now they are creating a 150 feet tall, whatever that is, to touch it, and I don't know what else they want to do with that, but this is what it looked like, and from here we're going to just move on real quick, but hey, this is the Maitreya project, and as you see, this is going to be the planned statue, and he's got that hand sign all really quite familiar. Where from, you wonder? Well, you have seen it all over the place lately. You just can't not see it. All the main puppets throwing these signals up all over the place and that's 666 for you 666 okay so that's what they are working real hard but this is not even the end of it right so this is the Maitreya project and now from this we're gonna jump right into something else and I need you to remember that Maitreya figure, because we're going to take a look at Vishnu, who is the Hindu god. And strangely enough, somehow Vishnu has got his or her, whatever she is or he, hand up just the same way as you saw. Maitreya, which is Buddha. Okay. So just remember that insight and the glowing behind the head. Now Vishnu is part of a trinity. Strangely, same kind of concept that you have in so-called Christianity. Now let's see what we can find out about the Trinity. So Vishnu, this is bbc.co.uk, Vishnu is the second god in the Hindu Triumvirate. The Triumvirate consists of three gods who are responsible for creation, upkeep and destruction of the world. The other two gods are Brahma and Shiva. Brahma is the creator of the universe. Shiva is the destroyer. Vishnu is the preserver and protector. Now, we're not going to waste much time on Hinduism either, but I want you to remember Vishnu, it's particularly this hand gesture that Vishnu have here. Okay, because this is Brahma, this one, he's got his hand right up in a devil horn. Okay. And Shiva as well, with her hand up. right up there as well as him so-called Jesus Christ or another one right
exact same thing and if you start wondering where you've seen this before then I'll show you where yeah this is the Pope with the exact same hand sign and Baphomet the gold god just one more thing in regards to the Pope and Baphomet and for that I need you to remember this stuff with the two snakes which is the Caduceus because this called Caduceus just so happens to feature right here with good old Pope Francis kissing this Giza who's the patriarch who seemed to have it too so it really should make you wonder what has it to do with the so-called Catholic Church and the Church of Satan as well as sadly your medical community because this is the emblem of medicine in the United States right but let's go back to let's go back to that hand sign which we've seen all over the place now and from there we can really hammer it home what the image of the beast in the Bible really is now for that we really need to start with Revelation 13 and we're gonna just break it down to make it real easy to get to the image of the beast and what it is today so Revelation 13 verse 1 starts as and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns and upon his ten horns ten crowns and upon his heads the name of blasphemy and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard and his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion and a dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority okay so let's just break this thing down so this is talking about John from on the Isle of Patmos seeing this beast coming out of the sea and it is heaven heads and ten horns and you got ten crowns and upon these heads the name name of blasphemy now this quite clearly refers to the Vatican okay because the seven heads refer to the, to the seven uh, hills which Rome was built and it's coming out of the sea the Mediterranean Sea and full of blasphemy we can quite easily um, figure that out as if you look at some of the things that the Vatican teaches and just the way the Vatican actually built so let's look at that real quick there's just going to be one single thing I'm gonna home in on and that's going to be the actual St. Peter Square um, which you can see right here which is nothing else but a giant sun wheel with the follow symbol which is the obelisk from Egypt which is a pagan symbol 
so is the sum real in the middle and um, all the rest there's awesome videos you can you can watch to discover more but this is the sun wheel from the very babylonian pagan worship the israelites were fighting against right so that's the same thing right there for you here and if we just look at some of the decisions that the pope or the vatican has made you can look at sunday worship the changing of the laws and so on so on so that's what the blasphemy refers to or even that saying that the pope is is the vicar of god so that kind of things that's all the blasphemy it refers to okay so he goes on to say and the beast which i saw was like unto a leopard and his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion and a dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority okay now the leopard the bear the lion this refers to the these very empires prior to rome babylonian um persian greece grecian greek and eventually rome because rome has all those pagan traditions combined together so the catholic church is pretty much the, the amalgamation of all these pagan rituals and traditions together it's got nothing to do with christianity and this is what it refers to here now let's find this dragon and what we can uh, find about that and for that we don't even need to go too far because we're just going to jump back to revelation 12 and read and there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns seven crowns upon his heads and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and it cast them to the earth and a dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born now the child who was, was born was uh, christ and israelites and the dragon in the third part of heaven this is the fallen angels and satan cast down from heaven and to really seal that argument it's the same chapter verse 9 and the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and satan which deceiveth the whole world he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him okay so that's pretty obvious that that dragon refers to satan or the devil and his is the end of third of the angels that fell with him and this very dragon gives the power to this um beast which is rome the papacy and pretty much the ruling elite but let's just stick to to rome right here and the vatican and i saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death okay so now this is a little bit more complicated of an issue to solve but by no means impossible so let's see what we can find out about this head that was wounded to death this head that's wounded to death is no else but napoleon invading italy and exiling pope pius the sixth so let's take a look at that in 1796 french republican troops under the command of napoleon bonaparte invaded italy defeated the paper troops and occupied ancona loreto now i urge you to read this through 
because this is fascinating, but we're going to jump right down to General Berthier, who marched to Rome, entered it unopposed on February 10th, 1798, and proclaiming a Roman Republic, demanded of the Pope the renunciation of his temporal power. And this is what Revelation refers to as the head were wounded to death. Now, it goes on to say in Revelation that and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wandered after the beast. All right, so for, to, to decipher this, we're going to go to the letter on Concordat, which is BibleLight.net. You can find this. And the letter on Concordat of 1929, which is the paper wound healed. So this is a treaty between the Italian government and the Papal Vatican. So let's see. Vatican and Italy signed pact recreating a papal state. In Rome, February 11th, the Pope is again an independent sovereign ruler as he was throughout the Middle Ages, though his temporal realm, established today, is the most microscopic independent state in the world and probably the smallest in history. This is New York Times. You can see uh, Mussolini and Cardinal Gaspari signing a treaty with all the seals and the signatures. But what's fascinating that you find it down here from the San Francisco Chronicle, which says that the heel wound of many years, as Cardinal Gaspari's word. So that going to refer right back to Revelation, where you see the deadly wound healed and all the world wanders after the beast. What does wandering after the beast mean? We're going to find that one out. But Revelation goes on and says, And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Okay. Now, we know that Satan is... The dragon and gives power to this beast which is the Vatican which has got the deadly wound healed in 1929 now let's see what else is there and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the found foundation of the world. What's interesting in this is this 40 and 2 months. Because this goes back before the 1798 period all the way back to Constantine. Now I know it doesn't make much sense right now the 40 and 2 months is 1260 days which is 1260 years. So if we go back from 1798 1260 years there's a very interesting thing happens. 
So let's just look at that. And that is the Justinian Code. This is a copy of the decree of the Justinian Code by Emperor Justinian. This code was put in place in 534 AD. This decree was made against those who did not support the Trinity Creed. The Trinity Creed is no else than uh, than the Trinity, the Holy Trinity, the Vatican uh, promotes. That's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one entity, which is not true. So the papacy used this decree to destroy all those that were found to be non-Trinitarian. A group of people were destroyed in 538, and I need you to remember this, AD called the Ostrogoths. Many of us will recognize this group as the third horn that was uprooted by the papacy. So after destroying the Ostrogoths in 538 AD because of their unbelief in the Trinity Creed. Now this year, if you add 1260 years which is a three and a half year or 40 and two months, then that's going to be the reign and state terror of the Vatican from 538 to 798 when the deadly wound was sustained by Napoleon. And after that, we saw the wound that was healed. So, okay, let's recap it. This is here. When it says 40 and 2 months, that is 3 and a half years, which is 1260 days. Now, if we take 1260 days from the start of this church and state terror, 338 AD, we end up in 1798 when Napoleon conquered Rome and there's a deadly wound. And after the deadly wound healed in 1929 with the signature of the letter on signing of the letter on Concordat. Now, I hope that this makes sense because this is how you can decipher Bible prophecy and and prove that the Bible is true. So this 40 and 2 months. Let's just check it out what it says again. And there was given unto him a mouth. Speaking great things and blasphemies. Which is the trinity. And power was given unto him. To continue 40 and 2 months. 1260 days. 1260 years. And he opened his mouth. In blasphemy against God. To blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven, which is, which is God and the holy angels. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, all the people that didn't believe in, in his blasphemies, like a trinity, and, a, and the Sunday worship, and to overcome them. That's the hundreds, that's about a hundred million people that were, was killed during the, the Inquisition years. And power was given him over all kindreds, and tongues and nations. That's the worldwide uh, rulership of um, the Vatican, the Catholic Church. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So the whole earth, everybody that, that worships and wonders after the papacy aren't found in the Book of Life. And let's just see how the world, world wonders after Vatican right now. I just randomly gonna choose a few articles. This is Matt Fred, who is 
going to write about 15 surprising things atheists are saying about Pope Francis. Right, so this is Sarah from England. I am an atheist and do not believe, but I love this new Pope. Popes are put on a pedestal and seem untouchable. This Pope, from the get-go, has been a per people person. You can almost feel the love radiating from him. So from one human to another, he shows such compassion and humility. Love him. This is Court R. I am an atheist, but I believe he is a great example of how religious folks ought to be. As an atheist, not speaking for all of them, I am a huge fan of this Pope. I think people need to find their own reason to be good to others. For some, it is God. Others find that they want to be good for other reasons. Okay, Wesley. Song. On the other hand, some people use God as their excuse to be a thick. So I'm sure if this is an example of the Pope acting like a good God, but rather he is a good person and his faith only amplifies the goodness of his own character. Now, Iron Hand 43, I don't believe in God, but this guy, as a human being, just rocks. Okay, let's you thank, thanks, thanks for watching. As an atheist, let me say that I wish more people in general, religious or otherwise, followed this man's example. The world would be a better place for it. Go on and on and on to talk about Pope Francis. Now what I want to show you is Luke 6 chapter 25. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall uh, mourn and weep. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. And I think this represents uh, this issue here perfectly. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Now here, we're going to find 10 reasons why, peep, why I am falling in love with Pope Francis. Now this guy here will talk about that never in my life did I imagine that I would connect so deeply with the Pope. I grew up in an area that is deeply anti-Catholic. Okay. And we're going to see what he's saying about this guy. So he says, 10. He understands that social justice is at the heart of the Christian gospel. And conservatives hate him for it. The, the, the social justice is, is not in the heart of Christian gospel. The Most High God is in the heart. And and the law, statutes and commandments. And off from that will come social justice and all the rest of it. He calls unfettered capitalism a new tyranny. But you don't need to be a genius to, to, to recognize that, right? He sneaks out at night to serve the homeless. He has embraced biblical modesty in a way unlike his predecessors. This is all an image, right? This is an image. You've got to see that. He says that we shouldn't judge our LGBT brothers and sisters. Now, this he's, the Pope Francis says, quote, who am I to judge a gay person of goodwill who seeks the Lord? You can't marginalize these people. Well, the LGBT agenda is really big. And so the Pope is, is a good Satanist, will always push this agenda. But let's just see what the Bible says about this. This is uh, Paul, 1 Corinthians 6. No, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, be not deceived, 
neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Abuser of themselves with mankind that refers to gay what he calls our gay brothers and sisters or LGBT what and so on it goes um, because you know these things are all these things are all pretty much a theater you got to see that this is where the majority of this mankind at the moment is. They need the circus, the superficial things, where he lives, who he talks to, all that kind of things. What they don't understand is that the Most High God does not care about these things. He cares about obedience and then love. Obedience is the following of the law, statutes and commandments. And this Pope does not do that. And let me just uh, just show you one more last thing that he does. And that he made it clear that atheists can be great people. In early 2013, the Pope broke tradition by saying that the perception of atheists by the church were they were evil people and they was wrong. He said atheists are good people simply because they do good. So, again, I would look at the scripture. For that, we need to go to, again, Paul letters, 2 Corinthians 6, 14th, 14th verse. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light? with darkness I think that is pretty straightforward be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers and that is when he's saying that atheists are good people and then he's getting together with this atheist guy who's actually by the way the president of Uruguay okay now go back to Revelation 13, and and w w so we we find out up to the ninth verse what's going on. Now let's move on. Ninth verse: If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be kill killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. This is sticking to the Bible and the true God. Sticking to your faith in the tribulation that is coming. And it has been going on for a long time. Now here, this goes on in 11th chapter, uh, verse to say, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth, and them that which dwell therein, to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. Now this beast, the, the, the lamb with the two horns that spake as a dragon, is going to be the United States of America. Now how you can know that? In 13th verse. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven, and on the earth, in the sight of man, and deceiveth that them dwell on the earth, by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live now this image of the beast we're gonna jump into it 
and that's going to be the conclusion of this video so let's just see what we found out so far about the image of Christ here's the image the conventional Jesus Christ with the sun disk behind his head and his hand up in that suspicious manner and you can go on and on and on You're always got the sun disk he's got the finger up and he's always white now we looked at things like Shiva who just so happens to have her hand or his right up there with the sun disk right here again end up with the sun disk we're gonna look at Brahma you got the sun disk hand up even the little devil horns there right same thing same thing as you have with Vishnu hand up sun disk even the devil horns right there up there let's and we, we looked at Buddha in the beginning oops there we are hand up devil horns sun disk right all over the place almost the same thing as you got see there okay right there now there's things like Zoroaster and he's got his hand up and the sun disk behind his head okay now what does that mean you wonder we gonna decipher that but to do that we gonna have to go way back in time all the way back to the time of Alexander the sixth Pope who is Rodrigo Borgia and he was a corrupt worldly and ambitious Pope whose neglect of the spiritual inheritance of the church contributed to the development of the Protestant Reformation now this goes on to describe his family background and this is full of of um, sin pretty much like you would expect from a, gro a Roman Catholic Church um, now what's important in regards to this person is that he had a son Cesare Cesare in September 19 1493 Alexander created his teenage son Cesare a cardinal along with Alexander Farnese so Cesare, his son, was a cardinal. And also what you want to understand is that these people have been fighting for more and more power throughout their reign. So much so that as you saw, the Protestant Reformation came, came about so as much as they neglected the spiritual roles of the papacy there's another fascinating things you'll find here and that is as a patron of the arts alexander erected a center for the university of rome restored the castel san angelo built a monumental mansion of the apostolic chancery embellished the vatican palaces and persuaded michelangelo 
to draw plans for the rebuilding of the St. Peter Basilica. He proclaimed the year uh, 1500 a holy year of jubilee and authorized its celebration with great pomp. He also promoted the evangelic evangelization of the new world. So there's a link to Michelangelo. With this, I wanted to highlight that they had a very strong connection to art. Now, it's not so much Alexander that is interesting for us, but more so his son, Caesar. So let's look at him in a little bit more detail. And this is Britannica.com, Cesar Borgia. Now, we're not going to waste much time on youth, because we know that he was the son of Alexander the Sixth, Pope, and then we're just going to go right to his rise of power. If you remember, he was Archbishop, and later on he was Cardinal with the titular church of Santa Maria Nova. He was now one of his father's principal advisors. It was already clear, however, that he did not have a true religious vocation. He was better known at the paper court for his hunting parties, his amorous liaisons, and his magnificent clothes that for the meticulous observance of his ecclesi ecclesiastical duties. On the death of Pedro Luis in 19, uh, 1488, the title Duke of Gandia had bypassed him and gone to his younger brother Juan. However, Cesare was reputed to have been extremely jealous of this brother, and when Juan mysteriously murdered in 1497, the rumor gradually spread that Cesare was the culprit. No evidence, however, that he murdered his brother, beyond the fact that he was certainly capable of murder as he subsequently proved. From here on, you can go on into his petty fight for, uh, for power. However, what's interesting for us is that what we find right here, the propaganda war waged against them, which is the, the Borgias, was vitriolic and lastingly effective. Cesar was portrayed as a monster of lust and cruelty who had gained an unnatural ascendancy over his father after having supposedly killed his brother, the favorite son Juan. It seems likely, however, that the two Borgias worked very much in harmony. Alexander was by far more astute politician, and Cesare the more ruthless man of action. Ambitious and arrogant, he was determined to establish himself as an Italian prince before his father died and left him deprived of the political and financial support of a papacy. Either Caesar or nothing was the motto he adopted to indicate the single-mindedness of his purpose. A number of political association, assassinations have been attributed to him, but the crime of which he was most clearly the author was the murder in August five, uh, 1500 of his brother-in-law Alfonso, Duke of Biseglia, the second husband of Lucrezia. It seems likely that this was an act of personal vengeance rather than politically motivated association, but it contributed assassination, but it contributed greatly to the fear and laughing in which Cesare was held. Okay, so that's the kind of person. Cesare Borgia was. At the end, towards down here, however, we're gonna see something interesting. This is talking about Cesare. His interest tended to be scientific and literally rather than artistic. But once again, time was too short for him to emerge as an important Renaissance patron. Leonardo da Vinci was for a short time his inspector of fortresses, but executed no artistic commissions 
for him. So there's Michelangelo and there's Leonardo da Vinci. Da Vinci. And what's, what's fascinating about this is that we know that Leonardo da Vinci is the author of The Last Supper painting. He's the painter of it. And that's the Jesus figure in that painting. Now let me show you something. NewWorldEncyclopedia.org Cesare Borgia And you going to find his portrait right here. That just so happens to look like what we call Jesus Christ. And to hammer this home, I will show you something fascinating from the Apocrypha, which they claim is not relevant or even dangerous. Okay, let's just jump to the Apocrypha. And he goes on to say that, Therefore even upon the idols of the Gentiles shall there be a visitation, because in the cre creature of God they are become an abomination, and stumbling blocks to the souls of men, and a snare to the feet of the unwise. For the devising of idols was the beginning of spiritual fornication, and the invention of them the corruption of life. For neither were they from the beginning, neither shall they be forever. This refers to all the idols that, that you see in the Vatican, all the people that bind to crosses, kissing Marys and pictures and all that. For by the vain glory of man they entered into the world, and therefore shall they come shortly to an end. An idol can do nothing for you. This is what it refers to. It doesn't matter how much you pray for a cross or a a painting or whatever. It's forbidden in the Bible quite clearly that you shouldn't do that. For a father afflicted with untimely mourning, when he hath made an image of his child soon taken away, now honoured him as a god, which was then a dead man, and delivered to those that were under his ceremonies and sacrifices. Right? Creating a god, an image. Thus, in process of time, an ungodly custom grown strong was kept as a law, and graven images were worshipped by the commandments of kings. Making this image God and praying in every single church that you see to this image. Whom man could not honor in presence because they dwelt far off, they took the counterfeit of his visage from far and made an express image of a king whom they honored, to the end that by this their for forwardness they might flatter him that was absent as if he were present. Now, I don't want to get into it anymore, but I think this is fascinating that this describes the exact process I described to you how this Cesar Borgia became your and everyone's Jesus Christ. And this is sadly what the Bible refers to that they should make an image to the beast. And that's the image of the beast. Now, lastly, and I'll finish off with that, is, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should bo both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. This is a very simple 
think and this is in the future this has not happened but I'm sure that we can find out what this is if you have not heard about project bluebeam I urge you to search it and get to know it because it's a fascinating project by the United States government and that just goes back to the second beast here who have power and making great wonders now project bluebeam is another thing from that and that is that they can project holograms in the sky like what it, like i mean i'm not trying to say that like likewise like this however they could do this if they wanted to so all the ufos and this and that and whatnot partially obviously that's fallen angels but partially this is testing of project bluebeam because they will fake the second comet and that's what it says and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast because they will project this image which is the Jesus Christ which is the false Jesus Christ and make people believe that he has returned but we know that this is not the right image and I will at the end of this video prove it to you but now I just want to show you at what level the hologram technology is at the moment Now just by accident they're showing you a dragon mind you but this is a hologram it's pretty crazy Just one more because I thought this is crazy. In case if you thought that, you know, they cannot do it. I mean, just by accident, they showing you the New World Order police state figures, right? All the black uniform, like policemen. They look like all these dancers. I'm gonna jump forward a little bit. And you got naturally the sun discs and all the pagan and satanic symbols all over the place. And just so you understand how much this is a Freemasonic display, it you got the two uh, pillars with the lighting bolts, the M's all over the place, which are lighting bolt for Satan. Now you got all over the place the triangles right here which you can take a sixes I hope that you can see that 
So this is just unbelievable. I mean, if you've got eyes to see, then this is just a orgy of satanic symbols. And this is a hologram of Michael Jackson. Okay, now, so this is pretty much what Revelation says that give power to, so the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. This is a future. We could, when we have the, the one world religion, the mark of the beast is instituted. And they're going to fake the second coming of this fake Messiah, Jesus Christ, the white person. Okay, now we came, and then from then on you know the cause, all both small and great, that's the mark of the beast and the 666. What I want to show you is the true image of God. Again, this is Revelation first chapter. And this is John describing what he's saying. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were like white wool as white as snow and his eyes were as flame of fire and his feet like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters right so just hang in there and we're going to reveal the true Christ of the Bible soon. So let's recap that again. His head and his hairs were, like, were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were as flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, if they burn in a furnace. Okay, so I guess you understand my point, right? Hair white like wool, eyes burning fire, he's got blue eyes, right? Feet like fine brass. Now, he, th th this geezer is white like snow, the, the actual skin color. A fine brass is all over like this. That's fine brass, right? But that's fine brass. That's brass color, right? This is the image of the beast, the counterfeit Jesus Christ, Satan's image of the beast. And this right here is hair white as snow like wool, Feet or skin color as fine brass, eyes like fire, and this is the true image of Jesus, or what we call what people call Jesus. But this is Christ, and this is pretty much the image of God since He's a Son of God. And if you can't see this, hair white like wool. Why is snow, eyes like flame of fire, and feet like fine brass, and the dead should look like this? Then you have to go with this. But that will lead to damnation. The time is coming when the true Messiah will return. And it's good for you to know that the, the, this is the way he will look like. 
and I know it's hard to believe because we've all been brainwashed into believing that Christ was white, blue eyes, brown hair, but that's just like Satan always does the exact opposite of the truth. And this is the truth. That this is what Christ looked like. Since he was from the Middle East anyway, how could it be like this? But the point is that understand that there will be a deception. Just as the Bible uh just as the Bible warned people that there will be a deception. And you will need patience and long suffering to get through that period. So with that I would like to say blessings and I hope this helped. And as always, I suggest that you start studying the Bible diligently. Repent of your sins and get ready. Because the day of judgment is coming. And who will deliver it is something like this image. So be not deceived by Project Bluebeam and the false Jesus Christ when he returns. Speak to you soon.